First Corinthians 15, 57 only. Mm -hmm. but, but thanks, thanks be, be to God, God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. If you believe that, join us in saying it. But, but thanks, thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. Now my subject tonight is how to be delivered from evil spirits or demons. I preached once in a place where the pastor said, well, you can pray for people, but don't call them demons. Well, he was in charge, so I went along with it. But demons and evil spirits are used interchangeably in the New Testament. So I'm going to teach on whichever way you prefer it, how to be delivered from demons or how to be delivered from evil spirits. But the important thing is how to be delivered. Now I'm going to try and give in brief outline a pretty thorough overview of this subject, which I think is one of the most neglected subjects in the contemporary church. There are a few people who go overboard on deliverance and preach about nothing but demons. The great majority of preachers simply try to behave as if they weren't there. But the truth of the matter is, they are there. Very close. Some of them in some of you. I'm going to read from Mark chapter 1, verse 23. This is the first specific recorded miracle in the earthly ministry of Jesus. And it's very significant. Mark chapter 1, verses 23 and following. There was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. That's another word for an evil spirit. And he cried out, not the man, but the spirit in the man. Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now it's remarkable that demon knew immediately who Jesus was. It took the disciples about one and a half years to discover what the demon knew immediately. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Come out, be quiet, or in, in Greek, be muzzled, and come out of him. Now Jesus was not speaking to the man. He was speaking to the spirit in the man. And then it says, When the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he, the spirit, came out of him, the man. This is a very significant uh, example in the ministry of Jesus. He did not put the man out of the synagogue. He put the demon out of the man. Now in many congregations today, if a man behaved like that, they'd put the man out of the church and leave the demon in the man. Jesus knew he was not dealing with the man. He knew he was dealing with the spirit in the man. It was a direct spirit-to-spirit -spirit contact between Jesus and the man. Then it says, they were all amazed. So that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new doctrine with power. For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. This is something they had not seen before. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. I want you to understand that initially Jesus was known amongst his people as the man who can cast out evil spirits. That was the first impact of his public ministry. Other aspects of his ministry appeared later, but the first thing that impressed the people was that he knew how to deal with evil spirits. Then in, a little later, it says in Mark chapter 1, verse 32, at evening, the same evening, and it was at evening because the Orthodox Jews did not travel any distance on the Sabbath, and it was a Sabbath. So they had to wait till the sun set to move. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were, I prefer to say, demonized. My text says demon-possessed, but that's a very misleading phrase. And it has nothing to do with the original Greek. 
The original Greek is one word and it means to be demonized. I looked it up in the New Collins English Dictionary and it says to be demonized means to be afflicted by a demon. That's exactly what it is. The problem with the word possessed is it suggests ownership. And people say indignantly, do you mean to say I'm possessed by the devil? Definitely no. If you're a Christian, you're possessed by Jesus. But you can be demonized. There can be areas in your personality where you are not in full control. That was what was with this man. He was apparently a regular worshiper in the synagogue. But the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus forced out something that maybe the man didn't even know was there. This spirit that didn't object to the synagogue, the only thing he objected to was Jesus. That was what he couldn't stand. And so it says, at evening when the sun had set, they brought to Jesus all who were sick and those who were demonized. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. Now notice, they came to be healed of their sickness. But in providing healing for them, Jesus cast out many demons. In other words, many demons are the causes of many sicknesses. And to be delivered from the sickness, you have to be delivered from the demon. Now let's continue in that chapter. Uh, Mark chapter 1 verse 39, And Jesus was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, and casting out demons. Please note, it was not something that he did occasionally in an emergency. It was a regular, ongoing feature of his total ministry. Every way he preached, he cast out demons. The two things went together, and Jesus never separated preaching from casting out demons and from healing. And one of the disasters in the contemporary church is those things have got separated. And so a lot of people who need deliverance don't get it, and a lot of people who need healing don't get it. Now we'll look just one other passage uh, on this ministry, which is in Luke 4, 41. This is the same event described by Luke. Luke 4, verse 40 and 41. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. Notice again that Jesus never separated healing from casting out demons. Because demons are the cause of many sicknesses. Sometimes directly and sometimes indirectly by creating attitudes in people which prevent them from receiving healing by faith. Then we look on in Luke 13, verses 11 and following. There was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no wise raise herself up. Notice, it was apparently a totally physical condition, but it was caused by an evil spirit of infirmity. And if you read the record, Jesus did not Pray for healing, he dealt with the spirit of infirmity. And then at the end he said, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound 18 years, be released from this bond on the Sabbath day? Notice Jesus said, Satan has bound this woman in a condition of physical infirmity for 18 years. Apparently the situation was totally physical, but in actual fact, the real cause was a spirit of infirmity. When the spirit went out, that woman who had been bent double for 18 years was able to stand up. And then let's look at what Jesus said a little later in Luke 13, verse 32. He said, Go tell that fox, and that was Herod, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures, Today and tomorrow and the third day I shall be perfected. The third day is a Hebraism for the day following. Today, tomorrow, the third day. How did he begin? By give, be, doing cures and casting out demons. How did he end? By doing cures and casting out demons. You know why he did it that way? Because it was the right way. He never had to improve. He started right. 
He finished right. He began that way. He ended that way. All we can do is do it the way Jesus did. We do not have to improve on his methods. Now I want you to see how he equipped his disciples. And we'll turn to Matthew chapter 10. And let me say while I'm looking for the passage, Jesus never sent anybody out to preach the gospel without specifically instructing and equipping them to deal with demons. It is not scriptural to send people out in evangelism without equipping them to deal with evil spirits. This is how he dealt with the first 12 apostles. Matthew chapter 10 verse 1. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Notice, the first authority he gave them was not to heal sickness, but to cast out evil spirits. And then these were the instructions he gave them. Verse 7, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Don't just say it, demonstrate it. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. That was their marching orders. You say, Brother Prince, have you ever seen the dead raised? Yes, I have. I've seen two people raised from the dead in Kenya when I was a missionary there. He is still doing the same things today. Why should we change? We cannot improve on what Jesus did. Let's make it our aim to do it as nearly as possible as he did it. And then we come to Luke chapter 10 where he sent out 70 others to prepare the way before him. It says in verse 1, After these things the Lord appointed 70 others also, and sent them out two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Now, we don't get the instructions that he gave them, but we do get the comment that they made when they returned. Because in verse 17 of that chapter, it says, Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. What was it impressed them most? The fact that they had authority over demons. If you believe the New Testament, I want you to say that with me. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. If you don't believe it, don't say it. But this is what I want you to say. Are you ready? Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Amen. All right, now then. We come to what they call the Great Commission at the end of his ministry when he was sending out the people who were to evangelize the whole world in Mark 16 and verse 15. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And let me say that order has never been retracted. And then he says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe will be Condemned. Let me say that in the, in the New Testament, no salvation is offered to anybody who believes without being baptized. You cannot find a single example in the New Testament. You may say, well, I believe, so I'm saying, well, that's your risk. But I wouldn't take that risk. Because Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Amen. And then he said, listen... These signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. The first of the five signs is casting out demons. We hear a lot about speaking with new tongues, but that comes second. Laying hands on the sick and healing comes fifth. The first sign is they will cast out demons in my name. Why shouldn't we do it? Can we improve on his methods? Matthew 28 verse 20, the same commission at the end of that chapter. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things that I have taught you. Well, amongst the all things that Jesus taught them was to cast out demons. So he said, when you make disciples, teach them to cast out demons. And when they make disciples, teach them to cast out demons. And had the church obeyed, we'd have had the same process going on for 19, 19th century. Unfortunately, the church tried to improve and made a mess of it. Now I want to point out to you that there are two kingdoms, two spiritual kingdoms. And when we come into this ministry of dealing with demons, 
the two kingdoms are brought right out into the open. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 26 through 28, Jesus had been accused of casting out demons by being allied with Beelzebub, that is, Satan. This is his answer. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come to you. The great single evidence of the coming of, this, of the kingdom of God is the casting out of demons in the name of Jesus. You see, this experience brings two kingdoms into open demonstration. The kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan. The kingdom of light, the kingdom of God. And when they meet, the light defeats the darkness. And Satan hates that. There are two things he doesn't want revealed. One is the reality of demons. The other is that Jesus has given us authority over demons. Because this reveals the clash between the two kingdoms and it reveals the supremacy and the victory of the kingdom of Jesus Christ over the kingdom of darkness. And Satan has done a lot of work in the church for many centuries trying to suppress the revelation of this message. Because it reveals his kingdom, brings it out into the open, and demonstrates his defeat. And he doesn't want that. He's afraid of it. Actually, of all the miracles that Jesus did, all of them but one were previewed in the Old Testament. Raising the dead, healing the sick, healing multitudes miraculous provision, all of them. There's one miracle that's never recorded in the, New, in the Old Testament. You know what it is? Casting out demons. That's why it is the distinctive mark that the kingdom of God has come. Now, what sort of things are demons or evil or unclean spirits? Let me say that the Bible does not give a clear account of where they come from. There are different theories. Some people believe they're fallen angels. I don't. I've dealt with so many demons that behaved in so many ways that were totally uncharacteristic of angels. In my opinion, for an angel to be encased in a human body would be a prison. But that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. There's no absolute scriptural revelation. But the the, the New Testament does tell us one thing about demons. It doesn't tell us where they come from, but it does tell us how to get rid of them. That's what's important. My description of demons is persons without bodies. It's very important to realize you're dealing with a person. In the early years of my ministry, I suffered from intense depression that would come over me and rest upon me like a dark cloud, and shut me in, keep me from communicating. And I struggled with it, I did everything. I prayed, I fasted, I reckoned myself dead, I knew the scriptures. And the more I prayed and fasted, the worse it got. And I had no remedy, and one day I was reading Isaiah chapter 60, 61. And it said, in place of the spirit of heaviness, the garment of praise. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, that's your problem, a spirit of heaviness, of depression. And when I knew that I was dealing with a person and not myself, you see, I'd been blaming myself for all of this. When I discovered it was another person, I was 80% of the way to victory. And actually, I understood by revelation that it was a familiar spirit. That is, a spirit that follows a family up. And I realized the same spirit had affected my father for many years. So all I needed was one other scripture. Let me share it with you. Joel 2.32 It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. I called on the name of Jesus and I was delivered. This thing, it was like a heavenly vacuum cleaner. It came down over my shoulders and just sucked this thing out. 
And I had struggled with it for years until I recognized it was not myself. It was another person seeking to afflict me. And I want you to understand, when you once realize you're dealing with a person who is not yourself, you're about 80% of the way to deliverance. Now, as I understand it, and I, let me say I've been dealing with demons for more than 30 years. I first got involved in 1963. Some people said, well, Brother Prince will soon give it up. He'll change his doctrine. I have to say at the age of 80, I haven't given it up, and I haven't changed my doctrine. And I'll tell you one reason, it's scriptural, and number two, it works. I want to offer you three objectives that demons have. Number one, to torment and torture. They are the torturers. Number two, to keep you from knowing Christ as Savior. And number three, if you come to know Christ as Savior, then to keep you from serving him effectively. Now we have to distinguish between two things, what's called the flesh and demons or evil spirits. The flesh is the old carnal nature that every one of us have inherited from Adam. All of us are descendants from Adam. And Adam did not beget any children until he was a rebel. And every descendant of Adam has the nature of a rebel in him. That's the old man. Now, the other thing that we deal with is evil spirits. And it's important to know what you're dealing with, because the remedies are completely different. See, I was dealing with the spirit of heaviness, and I was trying to deal with it as if it were the flesh. I was trying to crucify it because that's the remedy for the flesh. But you can't crucify a demon, nor can you cast out the flesh. You have to know what you're dealing with. A man came to me once and he said, Brother Prince, I want you to cast this demon out of me. I said, what's your problem? And he began to tell, tell me his difficulty in relating to his wife. I said, I don't think I can cast that out. It's not a demon, it's your fleshly nature. You have to crucify it. So we need to know, am I dealing with my flesh, or am I dealing with a demon? Now, I'm going to try to give you some directions, some ways of finding out. You see, the same word in both Hebrew and Greek is the word for spirit, breath, and wind. And uh, none of us have ever seen the wind. Do you realize that? We all know the wind is real. Why? Because we've seen what it does. We've seen it blow the clouds across the sky. We've seen the trees bend in the wind. We've seen the rain come horizontally across the horizon. We've seen the dust clouds rise in the street. We've seen people's hats come off. We know the wind is blowing. How do we know it? Have we seen the wind? No. We've seen what the wind does. It's the same with demons. We do not normally see them. Sometimes, by special revelation, people do, but normally, they cannot be perceived by human senses. How do we know they're there? By what they do. And I will give you a little list of characteristic activities of demons. Number one, they entice. There's not a single person here above the age of six who has not at some time been enticed to do evil. Very often it comes in words. Well, you see that nice gold pencil there? Pick it up. Nobody will know. If you dropped your pencil, they would do it to you. Anything that comes to you in words comes from a person. So you know that enticement comes from a person, a demon. Number two, they harass, or I think we say in English, harass. I'm bilingual and I have to remember which language I'm speaking. Anyhow, harass or harass, that's what they do. I have this little example in my mind, it's just not directly based on any single experience. There's this businessman, he's had a terrible day in the office. Everything went wrong, the air conditioning failed, his secretary didn't type his letters right. And then he got in the car to go home and he got in a jam in the motorway and he spent an hour sitting in his car opening up all the fumes. And finally when he gets home, his wife hasn't got supper ready and the children are running around screaming. And at that moment, as they say in America, he blows his stack. He loses control. 
he begins to shout and scream. And that demon of anger that has been following him around all day slips in. And after that, he's a slightly different person. From after that, at times, something comes over him and he wounds the people he loves most, his wife and children. And his wife looks at him from time to time and sees something in his eyes she never saw before. And then he's repentant and penitent and he says, I'm sorry, I don't know what made me do it. Well, we do know what made him do it. It was the demon of anger, see? It had harassed him or harassed him and in the moment of weakness, slipped in. Then demons torment. They are the tormentors. They torment spiritually. With the suggestion, God doesn't love you, you're not really saved. That's a common form of torment. They torment emotionally with fear. They torment physically with all sorts of horrible things like arthritis and so on. They are the tormentors. And Jesus said, listen, if you don't forgive your fellow believer, God will deliver you to the tormentors. Who are they? The demons. A lot of Christians are in the hands of demons because they've refused to forgive some other person. Then demons compel. They make us do things we don't really want to do. That some of the things they compel you to do are really comical. I had a letter after the deliverance service from a woman aged 25 and she said, for the first week in my life that I can remember, I haven't been biting my nails. What made her bite her nail? A demon. Can you believe that? I know it's true. And then demons enslave. They make you slaves. You see, people can sin and stop sin if they decide. For instance, a man may get drunk and then decide he won't get drunk and he doesn't drink anymore. He's sinned, but he's not enslaved. But an alcoholic is a man who can't stop drinking. He is enslaved. Now, if you put compel and enslave together, you get the word addiction. And in my personal opinion, almost every addiction of any kind is demonic. And there are a lot of respectable addictions. Some very unrespectable, some respectable. But if you are addicted, you have a problem. Your problem, I think, in 90% of the cases is a demon. Demons defile. They make us feel dirty and unclean. They project evil, impure images and thoughts and words into our minds. And I've talked with people at various times who said, just when I'm getting closest to the Lord, when I really want to worship Him, these horrible things come into my mind. And I said, you can be sure it's a demon. Anything that wants to keep you from worshipping God is a demon. Then demons deceive. They are behind all forms of religious deception. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, in the last times, some will depart from the faith, that's Christians, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And believe me, my dear brothers and sisters, there are a lot of different deceiving spirits with doctrines that are demonic, and they're very near to all of us. Finally, demons make people weak or sick or tired or kill them. I dealt with a woman once, this is a remarkable situation. 72 different demons came out of her. She was a respectable woman. She was a registered nurse. She was charismatic, Pentecostal, but she had 72 demons. I didn't count them, but there was a woman making a little note of the names. And in the middle of this, it lasted five hours. She said, oh, I'm so tired. I can't go on. I can't take any more. And I thought, well, poor woman, she really is tired. And then the Lord showed me, that's not the woman, that's the demon. I said, you spirit of tiredness, come out of this woman. 
And it said, not the woman, it said, that's right, she's always tired. She's tired when she gets up. She's tired when she's going to bed. She's too tired to read the Bible, too tired to pray. When that spirit of tiredness came out of her, she was no longer tired. We finished the deliverance. Demons make you go to sleep. There's a spirit of slumber. It's referred to both in the Old and the New Testament. Have you ever considered that you can sit up till 2 a.m., watching something that you probably shouldn't be watching on the television. But if you decide to read your Bible, you go to sleep in 10 minutes. Is that right? That's not natural. There's something there that doesn't mind your watching television. In fact, probably wants you to watch it. But does mind your reading the Bible or praying. All right, those are some activities of demons. Now, the main areas in which they operate. I have to give this in a very condensed form, you understand? I'm writing a book about it. Please pray for me. It's not an easy book to write. I discovered about 10 different kinds of spirits or demons mentioned in the Old Testament and about 20 in the New. That's 30. But that's just a little sampling. There are hundreds of different kinds of demons. The main area that they affect, I believe, is mo emotions and attitudes. And behind every negative emotion and attitude, there is a corresponding demon. That doesn't mean you've got the demon, but that means that the demons there are trying to get you. For instance, you can get angry, and it's not a demon. It's just you. It's your flesh. But if you get angry and can't control yourself, and get angry when you don't want to get angry, that's a demon. Let me give you a list of some of the commonest names that I've dealt with. And another thing about demons is they operate in gangs. When one gets in, it opens the door for the next. And if you find certain demons, you can always look for their friends. Let's take one. Pride, rebellion, Rebellion almost always follows pride. And then witchcraft or the occult. Because 1 Samuel 15 verse 23 says, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Wherever you find rebellion, look for witchcraft. The great historical example of this is the young people of the United States in the 1960s. Almost a whole generation went into rebellion. And almost every one of them ended in the occult, because rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, I thank God I saw scores of them gloriously saved and delivered, but I learned the lesson. Then, one of the commonest spirits is the spirit of fear. Paul says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, so it doesn't come from God. But fear is something that we easily, all of us, give way to. And it's followed by other things, like rejection. One of the commonest emotional problems in the church and in the world today is rejection. It's a sense of feeling unworthy, unwanted. Nobody really loves me. I'm on the outside looking in. And I would say, in my observation, at least 20% of professing Christians today that I've met need deliverance from rejection. It's really due to the breakup of the family. Because the thing that gives a child the sense of security is the love and the care of a father. And where that is missing, there's something that cries out. I don't know who I am. I don't feel secure. I don't know that people really love me. I want to tell you one thing. Jesus really loves you. But the devil will do his best to convince you it's true of everybody else but not you. Is that right? <laughs> All right. Then another common one. And here's a whole gang in the order they usually come in. Resentment, unforgiveness, anger, hatred, violence, and murder. And if the gang goes all the way, murder will be there. Now remember, murder doesn't mean you've committed murder. It comes in to make you commit murder. And the Bible says, he who hates his brother 
is a murderer. Not will be a murderer, but is a murderer. And then, this is the, the opposite. This, some people react, what do I say, aggressively. Some people react passively. I can't take any more. And so we get this little list. Disappointment. And that is a powerful spirit. Disappointment. If you've had a serious disappointment in your life, you need to check whether the spirit of disappointment has entered you. Disappointment, loneliness, nobody loves me, I'm all on my own. Misery, depression, self-destruction, or suicide. And have you noticed in our contemporary culture how powerful the forces of self-destruction are? People deliberately destroying themselves. That's just a little glimpse. I could speak for two hours on that whole area without covering it all. The next area is the mind. I think the mind is the greatest battlefield in the world today. Much greater than what's going on in Yugoslavia or the Middle East. It goes on in people's minds. And... Satan has a lot of demons with which he assails the mind. Number one, unbelief. Let's renounce unbelief right now, all of us together. Lord, we renounce unbelief. Say that. We renounce unbelief. We are believers. <laughs> unbelief has no place in us. <coughs> That's wonderful. All right, then doubt. Doubt is a mental demon. I had a very interesting experience years ago. A young theological student from, I think, Yale, I forget which, one of the top American universities, heard about my ministry of deliverance, and he got interested. So he came to a camp where I was teaching. But before he came, he made up his mind, nobody's going to change me. I'll leave that camp the same way I came. So... He came, he watched, he saw what happened, but he was true to his determination. He left the same way he came. But in the airplane on the way back, he got such a terrible headache, he thought he was going to die. And he began to cry out to God, and God showed him it was a spirit of doubt. And God showed him when it had entered him. One of his fellow students had said to him, Christopher, do you really believe Jesus fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes? And he gave this sort of compromise answer. Well, whether it really happened or not, it doesn't affect my faith in Jesus, which is a lie. And he realized that's when the spirit of doubt had entered him. Well, as he cried on the Lord, he felt it leave him through his left ear. Sitting next to him in the plane was a woman he'd never met before in his life. He didn't know her name. He turned to her and he said, I believe Jesus fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. <laughs> That's the way to cancel a wrong statement, is to make the right statement. See? Then there's compromise. That's another mental demon. I had a minister in a, what they call an old line denomination come to me once for counseling. And after I listened to him for a while, I said, you know, I think your problem is compromise. And he said, that's right. I said, he said, I've struggled with compromise all my life. He was a very quiet, well-mannered man. But when we, I came against that spirit, it became violent. It threw him across my office, to and fro. And I thought, I couldn't believe that compromise should, could be such a powerful spirit. Then there's forgetfulness. I think of a woman I dealt with once to deliver from the spirit of forgetfulness. And the spirit said, I can't come out. If I come out, she'll memorize all those scriptures. <laughs> it did come out and she did memorize the scriptures. Then confusion, a very, very common spirit. Torment, I think I've spoken about that. Tormenting you with lies, with insinuations, with denials of the word of God, and insanity. And it's surprised me how many Christians are secretly fighting against the fear of going insane. And the devil says something like this, well, you know, your aunt ended in a mental institution, and so did your cousin, and you'll be the next. 
And they can go through life fighting that fear of insanity. And it's a demon. It's a horrible demon. Another very important area is the tongue. And there are various demons that affect the tongue. Lying. Some people are compulsive liars. They don't even know when they're lying. Because another spirit has taken over. Cursing. Blasphemy. I was delivered from those two demons when I was saved. I could not speak five sentences without cursing and blaspheming. And when I was saved and all these demons came out of me, next morning, there was no cursing, there was no blasphemy. I didn't give it up, it gave me up. Then there's the two that are the church-going demons, gossip and criticism. <laughs> I was in a meeting once and a woman came and said, you have a spirit of criticism. I commanded it to come out of her. She started to cough and three other people all around started to cough at the same time. I said, I know the problem in this church. Then there's the subject that nobody ever talks about in church. That's sex. Let me say, sex is not evil, it is good. Get that clearly in mind. God created man sexual. And after he had created him, he saw everything he had made was very good, including sex. However, sex is so powerful that if the devil can get in there, he's got a major way of influencing your life. Here are some of the names. They're very obvious. Fornication. And you can call it premarital sex, but it's still a demon. Adultery. I think of a woman... Lydia and I dealt with years ago. She was a member of, well, let's say, the Episcopalian Church. She was a Sunday school teacher. And she had a real desire for God. But she told us that twice she'd committed adultery. And I had the impression she really hated it. She didn't want to do it. So I, talking with her, I discovered that when she was conceived, her father was living in adultery. And the result was she was born with a spirit of adultery in her. Well, she got delivered. And then she said, do you think I have to tell my husband? I said, that's your decision, not mine. But if you want God's real blessing on your marriage, you have to be honest with one another. Well, she said, he's a green beret. I don't think you people know that. I think they call it the, the special force, you know, these especially tough soldiers. He always carries a gun. And I said, it's your decision. <laughs> <laughs> and I, we didn't hear any more for a while. And then we heard she told her husband he'd forgiven her. Their marriage was better than it had ever been. But you see, she was totally innocent in a way. And that's why deliverance is so important. Because a lot of people suffer who are innocent. They're suffering as a result of sins of others. We need to offer them deliverance. Then there's masturbation. Some people say masturbation is natural. I don't believe that, but I'm not really concerned about that. Let me tell you this. If you have a problem with ma masturbation and you can't overcome it, and you hate yourself for doing it, and yet you go on doing it, it is a demon. And I can say without exaggeration, I've seen hundreds of people delivered from the spirit of masturbation. And let me tell you now, so I don't embarrass you later, it usually comes out through the fingers. And I've had scores of people tell me, Brother Prince, I don't know what's wrong with me. My fingers are going stiff, they're getting numb, they're bending backwards, they're tingling. I say, I can tell you your problem. It's masturbation. And listen, it's a very stubborn spirit. So if you want to get it out, you've got to be determined. Shake it out of your fingers. Go on until it's not there any longer. Plead the blood of Jesus against it. Now, if you're happy masturbating, don't let me spoil your happiness. But if you're a slave to it, as millions of people are, then I want to tell you, you can be delivered. And we'll come to the point where that will happen. Then homosexuality. Lots of people say people are born homosexual. They may be born, born with a homosexual demon in them, but that's not being born homosexual. I had a letter just recently from a Baptist pastor who had deal, been dealing with a young man, a Christian, who came to him and said, Pastor, I'm tormented. I had this thing in me, and I don't want it. 
And the pastor sat in front of him and quoted scriptures to him for about 10 minutes. And suddenly the young man lurched sideways out of the church, collapsed on the floor, and was delivered. And he rose to his feet and walked up and down in the office saying, Thank God I'm free. Thank God I'm free. Thank God I'm free. I have all the sympathy in the world for homosexuals, but I don't believe they need to stay homosexual. The church can welcome them, provided they change. Paul said to the Corinthian church, Such were some of you. Not are some of you, but were some of you. Jesus has the power to deliver homosexuals. Prostitution, pornography. They call pornography a billion dollar industry. What an industry. But it has a very strong hold and there are many in the church contaminated by pornography. And finally, sexual fantasy. There's a whole lot of people who fantasize about sex. Basically, fantasy is evil. So, if you have it, get rid of it. Then, there are what I call lusts, other strong desires. One of the obvious ones is nicotine. If you are a compulsive smoker, and you can't give up, you probably have a demon of nicotine. You can be delivered. I can say I've seen dozens of people delivered. Alcohol, again, if you're an alcoholic, you want to give up, you can't, you can be delivered. If you deal with it as a demon and hate it. Gluttony, that's just as dangerous as alcohol. Ultimately, it destroys life. Then there are various drugs. We don't, we can't go into the whole drug thing, but there are, there are strange addictions like Sniffing airplane glue, which is quite common with young people. Lydia and I once dealt with a young woman who was a member of a Pentecostal church, and she told us with great embarrassment, she said, I'm addicted to nail varnish. She said, if I walk into the cosmetics department of a big store, I've only got two options. I can either buy nail varnish or run out of the store. I've got no other option. Well, when that demon came out of it, it tore her and it came out screaming. It was powerful. Now, many addictions are branches that grow on a bigger branch. So if you're going to deal with the addiction, you probably have to deal with the bigger branch. The bigger branch is usually frustration. When people are frustrated, they turn to something for consolation. Drink, food, who knows what, drugs. So it's not enough in many cases to deal with the addiction. You have to deal with the frustration. Let me give you a simple example based on experience. You've got two women, each of whom has a husband who's unfaithful, runs around, spends too much money, and doesn't show much love for his wife. So they're both frustrated. One of them is an Anglican. She moves in pretty high society. And her solution is the cocktail cabinet. She just has to walk across the room and take a drink and she becomes an alcoholic. The other is a church of God. And, I mean, cocktail cabinets are not even in a vocabulary. So, but she has to find some comfort. Where does she go? Tell me. The refrigerator, that's right. Takes out an ice cream and becomes an addict. Yes or no? Are there people who are addicted to soft drinks? There are. Coke. I understand it's called Coke because one of the initial ingredients is cocaine. Do you know how many pints the average American drinks of soft drinks? 37 quarts every year. And I don't drink any, so they drink my share too. You have to decide where do you go for comfort. Because in times of pressure, we need something to take the pressure off. And usually what we need becomes an addiction. There's 
a strange silence. All right, then there's the occult, a major area. I think 90% of people in Britain today are involved in the occult, and most of them don't know it. I couldn't give you a list, but let me just tell you one thing. The New Age is a kind of catalog of the occult, and it's not new. They all go back for thousands of years. But anything, let me say it this way, there are many ways into the supernatural. But there's only one way that leads into God's supernatural. And that is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if you enter in. If you get into the supernatural any other way, and I did myself before I was saved, I tried to become a yogi. I got into the supernatural, but it was not God's supernatural. Let me, do, let me warn you against fortune telling, one of the biggest snares of Satan today. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas arrived in Philippi, and there was a girl with a spirit of divination. That's fortune telling. Actually, what the Greek says, she had a, a python spirit. That's all it says. Because python was the snake associated with fortune telling in Greece. And she followed Paul and Silas, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who show to us the way of salvation. Remarkable. Every word she said was true, and she was the first person in Philippi to identify the apostles. And she was a servant of Satan. The fact that a fortune teller can tell you truth does not mean it comes from God. My wife has permitted me to tell this. Before she was saved, she was recommended by somebody to go to a fortune teller, a woman. She, the woman never saw her before and never saw her again, thank God. <coughs> She knew nothing about her. She told her three things about her. You cannot bear children. You have three adopted children, and your husband has left you. None of those did she know by natural means. But she was a servant of Satan. Why did Satan tell her the truth to ensnare her? It was his bait to get her into the ark. Oh, there's so many dangers. I dealt with a, Ruth and I dealt with a young woman here in Britain who was a Christian, but she'd, went, she'd gone to a fortune teller. She knew she shouldn't. And the fortune teller sold her, you'll be, a, you'll be a widow very young. And shortly afterwards, her husband was killed in a freak accident. And then when we came, she came to me and she was pleading with me to tell her that the fact she'd gone to a fortune teller had nothing to do with her husband's death. And I couldn't tell her. I did everything I could to comfort her, but I, I believed in a way it was a connection. I remember once I was praying for a woman who needed deliverance. She'd been a spiritist. And I was getting pretty tired because she wasn't really cooperating. And in the middle of it all, she suddenly said, I see you in a car, and it's wrecked against a tree. And I thank God I was on my alert. And I said, you lying spirit, I'm not going to be in any car that will be wrecked against a tree. And I never have been. That was more than 30 years ago. But suppose I had said, oh, isn't that awful? I'm going to be in a car that's going to be wrecked against a tree. You know what I'd be doing? I would be submitting to Satan's destiny for my life. And I would easily open the way for it to be fulfilled. There is a move in the charismatic movement which is mistakenly called prophecy, which tells people you can get a word from the Lord. And uh, we've had them in some churches I've been in. They come around and they say, how many of you want to hear from the Lord? I'll pray over you. I call it charismatic fortune telling. I do not believe it is from God. And I've seen lives and churches wrecked by it. We need discernment. Listen, there's two different ways of being guided. Number one is the regular, normal way. It's from the scriptures. Number two is special guidance by prophecy, revelation, vision. But if you are not following number one, you have no right to ask for number two. You understand me? 
In other words, if you're not walking according to the revealed will of God in the scriptures, don't ask God for a supernatural revelation because you'll get the wrong God. Well, <clears throat> all right, I can't take more time than that. False religions. I believe every false religion is demonic. And I'll list some without commenting on them. Christian science, unity, Islam, Baha'i, Freemasonry. I want to comment on that. I've summoned that one of the most deadly uh, snares of Satan. And it usually makes people violent. We have seen some very violent deliverance from people who had an involvement in Freemasonry. It also affects children. We've seen some terrible cases of children that were not normal as a result of involvement in Freemasonry. And if it's in your background, you need to renounce it. You may have an uncle or a grandfather who is a Freemason. It's bringing a curse on your life. All right. Jehovah's Witnesses, Theosophy, Humanism, and all Oriental cults, in my opinion, are demonic. Then there are heresies. That's departures from the Christian faith. And my little list, which is by no means incomplete, complete, is Mormonism, reincarnation, and all religions that emphasize salvation through works. Okay, they're all demonic. Then there's the physical body. And the, the list here could be endless. Many different forms of infirmity and pain are demonic. And you only look at the ministry of Jesus to see this. He dealt with many sicknesses by casting out the demons. I'll just give a little list of some of the evil spirits of infirmity or sickness that I have personally dealt with. And this list could be three times as long. Number one, epilepsy. Now, I do not say that all sicknesses are necessarily demonic. You have to have discernment. But I, if I did have to pick one sickness that I consider to be demonic, it would be epilepsy. And I have seen many epileptics delivered. If an epileptic comes to me now for prayer, I say this, I listen, I'm willing to pray with you, but there could be a battle. If you're willing to fight along with me, I'll pray for you. But if you expect me to do all the fighting, I won't pray. Then another very common one is stress. Stress is a person, not a condition. Migraine. Many different forms of head pain and nerve pain. Allergies. Now, I don't say all allergies are demonic, but I know a whole lot are. Let me tell you one really fascinating story. Years ago, a mother came to me with a child of about, a boy of about four. And she said, pray for my son. I said, what's the matter with him? She said, allergies. I said, what kind of allergies? She said, food allergies. I said, tell me what he's allergic to. She said, tell me what he isn't. Well, I said, if I pray for it, I'm going to deal with it as an evil spirit. Do you accept that? She said, okay. So I sat down beside this little boy and I said, now I want you to know that there's a bad spirit in you that keeps you from eating the things you really like. And I'm going to command that spirit to go in the name of Jesus. And when I command it to go, I want you to blow it out. You understand? I mean, he was like a soldier. He sat there. I did, did my prayer. I said, come out in the name of Jesus. And he blew out four times. That was all. No emotion, no excitement. So I thought, who knows what happened? So off the mother went, taking the son with her. Two days later, she was back. She said, pray for me. I said, what's your problem? She said, allergies. I said, tell me first what happened to your son. Well, she said, I took him home with me, and he marched right up to the refrigerator, opened the door, sampled everything in the refrigerator, and nothing did him any harm. So I want to emphasize this. It doesn't necessarily depend on emotion. Deliverance demands your will. You have to set your will against the thing that's tormenting you. A young man came to me once and he said, I'd rather think I have a spirit of lust, but I'd rather enjoy it. 
You think God will deliver me? I said, definitely not. God delivers us from our enemies, not from our friends. But if you, if you make your friend your enemy, then God will deliver you. So you may have a friend tonight, you've got to make an enemy before it'll come out. Then a very remarkable case, I was conducting a deliverance service, incidentally, in Murfreesboro. And uh, there's this young man, about 25. I said, now, when I pray, the Holy Spirit may easily give you the name that you've got to renounce. So you renounce that thing by name, and it'll go. It's like dealing with a dog. You've got a lot more authority over a dog when you know its name. So he came up to me afterwards and he said, Brother Prince, is there a spirit of tooth decay? And I said, well, I've never heard of it, but if the Holy Spirit says there is, then there is. Well, he said, that's what I've been delivered from. Well, I still know him today, many, many years later. He told me later, he said, before I was delivered, I would have a tooth filled and decay would set in under the filling and I'd have to do the filling, take on the tooth. Since I was delivered, that's never happened. So I believe there is a spirit of tooth decay. <laughs> now, one of the commonest is crippling. <coughs> it twists your body, makes you go crooked. I don't, I think, I must say, I think I've seen at least a hundred cases of people with crippling. I used to pray for people by checking their legs. And if the two legs were uneven, the short leg would grow out. And I would say to the people, now you're plugged in, help yourself. And I get people still coming to me today. I got a man just the other day, he came and said, my wife was delivered when you lengthened her leg. She was delivered from back pain. She's never had any more back pain ever since. But many times when I did that and Ruth was with me, we would see this spirit begin to do this. And the legs would begin to move. And we had discovered it was a spirit of crippling that would twist the body. And we had to come against it. I'm sure there are some here. Then I've talked about the spirit of sleep. So we don't need to go into that. Insomnia, the opposite. And then one of the commonest is the spirit of death. I can say, Ruth and I have seen hundreds of people delivered from the spirit of death. Obviously, the spirit of death doesn't come in because you're dead. The spirit of death comes in to make you die. And remember, Satan is a murderer. And he kills physically. And one of the commonest spirits that he uses is the spirit of death. And there are many ways it can come in. You can just get weary with life and say, I wish I were dead. What's the good of living? I might as well be dead. You know what you're doing? You're inviting the spirit of death. And he doesn't need many invitations. Or you may have been through a serious illness or surgery. And especially when you're under an anesthetic, the spirit of death can enter. One of the first dramatic deliverances I dealt with was a woman that Lydia and I prayed with for five hours. And various spirits, I mean, I'd never seen this happen before. I was totally new to it. Various spirits manifested themselves, named themselves. And I'm not saying I did the right thing, but when I think the sixth spirit that named itself was death. So I said to myself, death, is that all right? And I thought, yes. Revelation chapter 6, death is a person, not just a condition. So I said, when did you enter into this woman? And it answered three and a half years ago when she nearly died on the operating table. I discovered later that she was not aware of anything she was saying at that time. Her own personality was totally bypassed. So later I said, did you ever have a serious operation? She said, yes, three and a half years ago, I nearly died on the operating table. You see, it's a moment of emotional or physical weakness. I talked to a doctor once in America who had his own clinic. And I'd been teaching about this, and he said, you've helped me to understand something. Because he said, we have patients from time to time who die without any adequate physical cause. And I realized the spirit of death has killed them. One other spirit 
that we've dealt with very commonly is arthritis. Now, please understand, I'm not saying everybody has arthritis has a demon. That's why we have the gift of discernment. But in South Africa, a good many years ago, I was conducting a, what do they call it, a seminar on deliverance. There were about 1,000 people present. We called people forward for prayer, and a lady came forward, and I said, what's your problem? She said, arthritis. I said, I'm going to deal with it as a spirit. We prayed against the spirit. She was delivered and healed. Well, I thought I'm never going to have time to pray individually for all the people who have arthritis. <coughs> and there's a spirit of faith here. So I said, all of you who have arthritis anywhere in the auditorium, stand up. And about 30 people stood all over the auditorium. I said, now I'm going to command that spirit of arthritis to go from each one of you. And when I do, you let it go. And I said, then I did, I prayed it. Now I said, I don't want you to sit down until you're free from pain, remain standing. And after about 20 minutes, every one of those 30 persons had sat down. The spirit of arthritis had left them. And later, traveling in South Africa, we met several of them and confirmed that they've been healed. Now, I'm not saying that everybody who has arthritis has a demon. On the other hand, it's just about as typical a demonstration of what demons do as you could wish for. They torture, they torment, they twist. All right, now where are we? How are demons come in? I've got to do this very quickly. How are we doing for time? It's just about nine o'clock, so all right. I've got a special preacher's watch. <laughs> All right. Now, how do they come in? Now, I can deal with this subject for two hours, but I'm going to do it very, very quickly. First of all, an occult background in your family. In Exodus 20, the Lord said, if you become a worshiper of idols or in the occult, I will visit it on the third and fourth generation. So a lot of people suffer demonic oppression because of what their ancestors did. And if you count it back, you have 30 possible ancestors that could involve you in the occult. How many of us can say for certain, I know none of my 30 ancestors were ever involved in the occult? Very few. So that's a possibility. Well, you say it's not fair. Well, you have to deal with God about that. He said, I will visit the iniquities of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. You know, one great reason why we need the ministry of deliverance is because Satan isn't fair. He oppresses people who don't deserve to be oppressed. We need to be able to help them. Then personal occult involvement. That's reason number two. And here is a remarkable passage in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Verses 10 and following. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, that is, offering your child as a living sacrifice to the Lord to be burned on the altar of Moloch. Now notice the other things that are included with that in the same verse. You might say, well, I'll never offer my child in sacrifice, but just let's look at the other things. Nor shall there be one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer. Basically, those are different aspects of fortune-telling. So fortune-telling is put in the same category with offering your children to God in a fire. Okay? You see, I've been forced to realize this through writing this book. Millions of Christians are involved in fortune-telling one way or another, and they don't realize what God thinks about it. God hates it intensely. It doesn't mean he hates you, but he hates what you're doing. All right. Or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, as we'd all call spiritism. 
or one who calls up the dead. All those are different aspects of spiritism. As far as God's concerned, that's the same as offering your children to sa in sacrifice through the fire. For all who do these things are abomination to the Lord. Did you hear that? All who do these things are abomination to the Lord. Now that doesn't mean the Lord hates you, but it hates the things you've been in. He hates the things you've been involved in. All right, then prenatal influences. And I've dealt with many. Uh, it isn't a fetus in your womb, it's a person. All right? And it's a living person, and if. That's a solemn thought, isn't it? Well, I've discovered that babies are very. Unborn babies are very sensitive to what people feel and say about them. I, at one time in the United States, I was casting out a spirit of rejection from people in a certain age bracket. There were so many of them, I asked myself, when were they born? Approximately. And my wife Ruth was one of them. It was about 1929 to 1931. Now, you British people won't even know what that means. But for every American, it means the Great Depression. And they say that words with, with a certain feeling that you have to empathize with to understand what it meant. You have to understand what happened. Here's a mother. She's got five mouths to feed, and she doesn't have enough food. And along comes the sixth. She says, I wish I wasn't pregnant. That's all you need to say. That little thing in your womb feels rejected. My mother doesn't love me. It's born with a spirit of rejection. That is amazingly common. And such a person will tend to go through life saying, nobody really loves me. I'm not important. I'm not wanted. I'm on the outside looking in. Others can, I can't. You can be delivered. Then you'll know for the first time how much God really loves you. Because that spirit of rejection keeps telling you, God doesn't love me. He loves other people, but he doesn't love me. Then there's what I call soulish domination or manipulation by another person. This is a very common cause of demonic problems. I met a man, he's an evangelist. He's about 28 when I met him. He said, when I, since I left home, and that was before he was 20, he said, I phone my mother long distance wherever I am in the world every night. <laughs> you know what happened to him? The umbilical cord was never cut. His mother has dominated him all through his life. And there are many strong men, bank presidents, sports heroes, politicians, who are dominated by a mother. God, thank God for mothers. But don't thank God for mothers who dominate. And not always the mother. It can be the father. It can be another person. It can be a minister. It can be a priest. It can be a dabbler in the occult. But if you are tied to another person, that's demonic. And you need to renounce that involvement and be set free. And for the first time in your life, you'll become a totally real person on your own. The next way, they come in pressures in early childhood. James says, where envy and strife are, there are confusion in every evil work. In a home that's divided and torn by strife, there are all sorts of evil forces at work that a small child does not have power to keep out. And my personal observation is most demonic problems begin before the age of eight. Then there's the moment or the place of weakness. I worked once in Westbourne Grove with a Catholic doctor who was a real minister in his own way. He had his own house in Harley Street. I mean, he was a really successful doctor. But he would come where we were in Westbourne Grove, and he would come in and he'd say, bring out your dead. And uh, we prayed for all sorts of people. And... Uh, he understood things I didn't understand at the time. He said, remember, the devil chooses the weakest moment and the weakest place. I have never forgotten that. It's a profound truth. The weakest moment or the weakest place. 
And I want to look at 1 Peter chapter 3, a message for women, which can well be digested by men too. It says to Christian women, you are daughters of Sarah if you do well or do good and are not afraid with any terror. Did you ever hear that part? If you ever give way to sudden terror, you've lost your protection. And that has happened to thousands of people. I dealt with a woman once who, the spirit of fear entered her because she was standing in the street and a horrible accident just took place in front of her. And in that moment of weakness, the spirit entered her. I can't, I don't have time for it. Sinful acts or habits. Sinful acts or habits. You can sin without a demon entering. But if you persistently sin, you can almost be sure the demon that corresponds to that sin will be in you. Also, some specific acts open the way to a demon. My friend Don Basham, who's now with the Lord, was praying for a woman once who needed to be delivered from a spirit of lust. So he commanded the spirit to come out of her, and the spirit said, I'm not coming out. She invited me in. So Don said, well, when did she invite you in? When she went to that dirty sex movie. And Don knew, I mean, the spirit was right. You see, Satan is a legal expert. He knows when he's got a right. And that woman had to confess that sin and repent before she could be delivered. Finally, a person without self-control is like a city without its walls. Let me read that passage in Proverbs. Proverbs 25. This applies to almost all drug addicts. Proverbs 25, verse 28. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. So when you lose real control of yourself, your emotions, your appetites, your relationships, all your spiritual defenses are broken down. Almost any demon can walk in any time. Let me do that, do that once more, and then we're going to come to the most important question, which is how to be delivered. But let me just give these ways that they come in. Number one, an occult background. Number two, personal occult involvement. Number three, prenatal influences. Number four, soulish domination or manipulation by another person. Number five, pressures in early childhood. Number six, the moment or place of weakness. Number seven, sinful acts or habits. And then a general picture of a person whose walls are all broken down. Now, we come to the a really important issue, which is how to get rid of them. If I didn't have that to tell you, I wouldn't bother telling you all the rest. Now, I can say without exaggeration, I have seen thousands of people delivered from demons. And they got delivered the way I'm going to tell you how to be delivered. You can be delivered tonight. But there are certain conditions you have to meet. Number one, you have to be humble. <laughs> You know why? Because pride is the greatest barrier to deliverance. A, uh, a very sort of aristocratic southern lady in one of the southern states of America had been listening to my teaching and she said, Mr. Prince, if I understand you rightly, if I seek deliverance, I may end up screaming. I said, it could happen. But she said, I was brought up that a lady doesn't scream in public. Well, I said, if you were in a river, drowning, and about to go down for the third time, and you thought there might be somebody on the bank who could save you, would you be too ladylike to scream? And that's all I needed to say. <laughs> Number two, be honest. You see, you will not be honest if you're not humble. Call your problem by the right name. If it's lying, call it lying. Don't use some fancy psychiatric terminology to describe a filthy sin. Okay? Think of the worst name you can and call it that. Number three, confess your faith in Christ. 
Jesus is the high priest of our confession. If we make no confession, we have no high priest. If we confess our faith in him, we release him to act as our high priest. Number four, confess any known sin of your own or your ancestors because your ancestors' sins can be the cause of your problem. You're not guilty because of their sins, but you're suffering because of their sins. And in order to be delivered, you need to confess their sins. If the Holy Spirit shows you your aunt was a Christian scientist, confess that sin, all right? Because that's the way to be delivered. You see, God is old-fashioned. He still believes in confessing sin. It says in Proverbs 28, 13, the next thing is repent. It's not enough to confess, you have to repent. Repent means accept personal responsibility. Say, I was the one that sinned. I'm sorry, Lord. I don't want to do it again. Forgive me. The Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who covers his sins will not prosper. And that applies to every one of you. If you go out of here covering your sins, you will not prosper. It will not be well with you. But whosoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. So the remedy is confess and forsake. Then you need to break with every contact with the occult. Renounce it. Confess it, renounce it. And if you have objects that relate you to the occult, make a commitment to God to get rid of them. Burn them if you can. Bury them, do something with them. We had a young woman who'd been a Satanist. And uh, she came for deliverance, and she was getting delivered, but she told us that she had a ring on her finger with which she'd been married to Satan. So we said, you have to take that ring off. She took it off, and the demon made her swallow it. But there was a young man there who had supernatural faith, and he commanded her to regurgitate it. And coughed it up. He picked up the ring and threw it in the lake. And then she was delivered. But before she could be delivered, she had to burn publicly every garment in which she'd ever worshipped Satan. The Bible says, hating even the garment spotted with the flesh. Break every contact. Get rid of everything. It may be very valuable. A woman said to me once, I've got all these occult books. She said, they're worth thousands of dollars. I said, how much is your soul worth? That's the question you have to answer. How much is my soul worth? Then you have to forgive all other people. Jesus said, if you stand praying and you have anything against anyone, forgive. That leaves out nothing and no one. If you forgive, God will forgive you. If you do not forgive, God will not forgive you. That's absolutely flat out. So you have to make up your mind. Now let me tell you, forgiving a person is not an emotion. It's a decision. It comes from the will, not the feelings. And when you will it and say it, the Holy Spirit will give you the grace. But don't seek deliverance if you have bitterness, resentment, or unforgiveness in your heart against anyone. Then it's important to stand on Scripture. So I'll give you four Scriptures, any of which you can stand on. Number one, my favorite, I think, Joel 2.32, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, I give you authority over all the power of Satan and nothing shall by any means hurt you. 1 John 3, 8 says, For this purpose the Son of God was revealed, that he might destroy the works of the evil one. And Colossians 1, 13 says, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness, translated us into the kingdom of his Son. Let me give you those without that. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Why don't we say that together? Let's say not whosoever, whoever. Whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Amen. Jesus said, I give you authority over all the power of Satan. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. 
1 John 3, 8, For this purpose the Son of God was revealed, that he might destroy the works of the evil one. Colossians 1, 13, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Now, the way we're going to deal with this in a moment is I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If you want, you don't have to. And you, I'm going to say the words, and you will say them after me. I'm putting the words in your mouth. So many people say, I want to pray, but I don't know what to pray. Well, I'll give you the words. But you're not praying to me, and you've got to mean them as your own words. But before I do that, let me just go quickly through this list. Now, I know a lot of people get delivered without consciously doing all these things, but these are the scriptural bases. Number one, be humble. And remember, God says, humble yourself. God never promises to make us humble. Number two, be honest. Call a spade a spade and not an agricultural implement. Number three, confess your faith in Christ. And I'll give you the words. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God. You died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. Confess any known sins of yourself or your ancestors. Now, when we come to that, I'll pause and give you time, quietly, to confess any specific sins that you need to confess. Number five, repent. Remember, repentance is a decision, like forgiveness. It's not a feeling. It's the will. Turning around, turning your back. Break with the occult. If you've been involved with any form of occult, just quietly say, Lord, I renounce whatever it was. Fortune telling. I can't think of any other things at the moment. That's extremely bad. Anyhow, renounce them. And if you've got things in your home, tell the Lord you get rid of them. Don't go out of here and go back to a home that's infested with demonic objects. Forgive everybody else. And again, I'll give a pause. I'll give you time to name quietly the people you specifically need to forgive. My pastor, my wife. It's usually the people closest to us. We don't have a problem with people at a distance. But the person who shares your bed, that may be a real problem. Stand on Scripture. I think we'll stand on whosoever shall fall in the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And finally, expel. That's a modern translation of cast out. All right? I like it because it's not religious. I mean, we get so many religious phrases, we don't know what they mean. But if you've inhaled something that you don't want, what do you do? You expel it or exhale it, like the little boy that blew out four times. Now, when you do that, what first comes out may be just natural human breath. But if you go on, sooner or later, something else will mingle with the breath. That's your enemy. That's what you've got to get out. Now, at that point, do not go on praying. And don't speak in tongues. But while you're praying and speaking in tongues, you're holding the demon in. Be like the traffic in the street when the ambulance comes by. Get off to one side and let the ambulance off. Then you can go back to praying. Now it may be that you need deliverance from many demons. That's all right. We're not in a hurry. If you're not in a hurry, we'll stay with you. Don't stop when the first one goes. Just go on as long as you need to get in there. Rid of any of them. Now, I'm going to invite Don and Yinka to come stand with me and my wife because I like some support at this point. Then, those of you, and it's entirely your own decision, those of you that feel you may need deliverance from an evil spirit and you want to receive it here tonight, I want you to stand up. And then I will lead you in a prayer. If you feel you need deliverance, don't be embarrassed. Stand up.
All right, now I'm going to ask you to say this prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God and the only way to God. That you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. I now confess to you any sins of which you have made me conscious. All sins committed by my ancestors. Now just take a little while and be as thorough as you can. Confess anything specific that the Holy Spirit brings to your mind. Quietly. You don't have to tell anybody else. All right, now we're going on. The next thing is repentance. Lord, I repent of all sins I have ever committed. I hate them and I turn from them. I turn to you, Lord Jesus, for mercy and forgiveness. If I have been involved with the occult, I repent and I renounce it and I sever myself from it. Through the blood of Jesus. If I have occult objects in my possession, I commit myself to get rid of them. Now the next one is forgiving other people. Lord, I forgive any person who has ever harmed me or wronged me. I forgive them just as I want you to forgive me. Now take a little while and name the persons that you need to forgive. And the name that's hardest is the one you most need to say. All right, we're going on. Lord, to the best of my ability, I have met your conditions. And I now claim your promise. Whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. I'm calling on you now. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Deliver me from all evil spirits. I hate them. They are not my friends. They are my enemies. And I command them to go from me now. In the name of Jesus. Now you let them go, I'll command them to go. Don't go on praying, get rid of them. Now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, under the authority of the leadership of this conference, I come against every evil spirit that has been renounced in the name of Jesus. I command you to come out, release them, go from them. In the name of Jesus, let them go, let them go. You've been defeated by the blood of Jesus. You have been defeated by the blood of Jesus. Jesus Christ is Lord Amen. over this gathering. You have to obey the word of God. You have to obey the servant of God. We stand against you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. All your demons, you have to go in Jesus' name. Now I'm going to deal with specific categories. I'm going to start with the occult, with all forms of witchcraft. If it did not come out, let it go now. Now in the name of Jesus, we come against all occult spirits. Every form of witchcraft, sorcery, divination. Get out in the name of Jesus. Get out in the name of Jesus. Come out. Come out. Come out in Jesus' name. You bow before the name of Jesus. Release these people. Come out. Come out. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. That's right. That's right. You have to go. You have to go. 
you have to go. Jesus defeated you when he died and shed his blood and rose from the dead. Satan, you are subject to us. In the name of Jesus, every spirit of witchcraft, divination, sorcery, out in the name of Jesus. Go, release these people. Every spirit of false religion, out in the name of Jesus. You have to go. You have to go. In the name of Jesus. That's right. Then rebellion. There are many of you young people here tonight who have a spirit of rebellion. Come out. Go from there. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Now, every spirit of fear. Say this, God has not given me a spirit of fear. I renounce any spirit of fear. And I command it to go. In the name of Jesus. No. Let it go, out. Out, in the name of Jesus. Out. 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 That's right. Hate it. Hate it. Hate it. It's not your friend. Every spirit of grief. Out. In the name of Jesus. Every spirit of loneliness. Depression, rejection, come out! Every spirit of suicide, come out! Now then, I want you to say, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Are you there? I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Now, every spirit of death, come out. Go from these people. Release them in the name of Jesus. Release them in the name of Jesus. Release them. Every spirit of death. Amen. Come out. Come out. Come out in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Destruction. Self-destruction. Out. In the name of Jesus. That's right. I'm out. You shall not destroy the people of God. They're God's property. You release them and go from them. Right. Now we're going to deal with resentment and all the ones that go with that. Every spirit of resentment, come out. Every spirit of resentment, in the name of Jesus, release these people. Go from them, in Jesus' name. Unforgiveness, anger, hatred, violence, and murder, come out. In the name of Jesus. The spirit of murder, bow before the name of Jesus and come out. Go from them in the name of Jesus. Out, out, out. Some of you need to say several times to yourself, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. Say it for yourself. Be determined. Now, if there are any women here that have deliberately procured an abortion, to be delivered... You have to confess it as murder. And you'll be delivered from the spirit of murder and of death. If you confess it to God, you don't have to confess it to us. <coughs> you can be delivered. Now, Lord, we come against the spirits of murder that have caused women to murder their own babies. In Jesus' name, you get out of this place. You go from this place. We don't entertain you. We give you no room. 
We offer you no mercy. You have to go, go, go in Jesus' name. Now we're going to deal with the negative emotions. Disappointment. You, any spirit of disappointment here, we break your hold <coughs> over the people of God in Jesus' name. L loneliness, misery, depression, self-destruction. Out, especially depression. Come out, depression. Loose them in the name of Jesus. Loose them in the name of Jesus. There's many spirits of depression here tonight. Out. You go in Jesus' name. You release the people of God. All right. We're going to deal with the ones that affect the mind. Lord, we come against those spirits that torment the mind. Unbelief. Doubt. Compromise. Forgetfulness, confusion, torment, and insanity, insanity, you come out. 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 Amen. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I'm going to come against insanity again. That's right. Every spirit of insanity, you come out! Now, God has shown me there's a witch here tonight. I'm not going to point you out, but this is your last opportunity. If you don't renounce your trade as a witch tonight, you'll perish forever in hell. Out! In the name of Jesus. Out! 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 Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to deal with the tongue. Every lying spirit, come out. Not only the ones that make you tell lies, but the ones that lie to you. Tell you God doesn't love you. You can't be healed. There's no hope for you. Those are lying spirits. Renounce them in the name of Jesus. Every spirit that counterfeits sickness and tells healed people that they're still sick, you leave them in the name of Jesus. You release them. Go from them in Jesus' name. Every spirit of cursing and blasphemy, out in the name of Jesus. And every church-going spirit of gossip and criticism, come out. Humble yourself and acknowledge you're a gossip, you're a tailbearer. God hates tailbearing. There's no place for you in heaven unless you renounce it and get delivered from it. God hates those who sow discord between brethren. You need to repent. You're very religious, but you're also very wicked. All right, we come to the area that no one ever talks about, sex. All right, we're, we're going on with our program. Amen. Amen. And first of all, we're going to start with masturbation. Every spirit of masturbation, in the name of Jesus, you go from these people, release them. Release their fingers, release their hands, release their sexual organs in the name of Jesus. Out. Out. Don't be proud. Don't be proud. If it's in your fingers, shake it out. Let it go. That's right. 
In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You've got to hate it. It's not your friend. It's your enemy. That's right. Get it out. Let it go. In the name of Jesus. Through the blood of Jesus. Be determined. Be absolutely determined. You are not going to tolerate it any longer. It has no place in you. Your body has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And then we come to the other sins. Fornication, adultery, out. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. There's no place in heaven for fornicators and adulterers. Every spirit of homosexuality, yes. out. In the name of Jesus, out. In the name of Jesus, you go, you go, you go. Every spirit of pornography. Now there are several here tonight who are bound and enslaved by pornography. Renounce it. Let it go from you. What you do in secret, God sees. There are no secrets with God. Some of you are churchgoers, but you're pornography viewers. Out! Renounce it. Renounce it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. What about taking a few moments to thank God for what He's done? Amen. Thank, you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.